Hi, it's the World Football Show, and uh, for the next hour or so, in this special one-off, we'll be looking at the UEFA Champions League Final. I'm Gabriel Marcotti, and I'm privileged that you're joining us, but not just me. I've got my co-host here, my little sidekick, uh, <laughs> Mina Rizuki, and of course, Mina, we have a special guest. It's the very handsome and knowledgeable Andy Brassel. Uh, how about we start? Yes, Andy does deserve applause, but we don't have a studio audience today. <laughs> so let's reserve our applause for Chelsea and Bayern. Um, first off, does it bother us that we have two teams that one of them likely, one of them finished sixth, the other one finished second this season? Does that affect our enjoyment of the Champions League final? Well, it doesn't affect my enjoyment. I think, if anything, that this shows you that the champ football is dramatic and you never know what's going to happen. And I think that I love the way that Chelsea won this, uh, how they reached the final. It was really, it was really a game of, of heart, and they really wanted to be there. No, so it was but about but that. You've said how they reached the final, though, but Andy, we kind of got used to it the last few years, right? Last mm -hmm. year, we had United and, and, and Barcelona, right? Yeah. So you had champions of, of the Premier League, champions of Spain. I mean, champions won it that season. Mm -hmm. The year before that, um, Inter and Bayern, both teams on the verge of, of a treble. The year before that was Barcelona and United. Again, champions against, well, United finished a close second to Chelsea that season. I mean, um, those were legit teams. Yeah, I look at this with my cynical hat on. Neither one of these teams, they can win it, but nobody's going to say this team's the best in the world or maybe even in the top three or four, right? But nevertheless, I think we've been rather spoiled by Barcelona in that respect, you could say. Uh, you and know. by United being in the final too? Yeah, right? certainly, certainly. And if, if you think about it, you know, Bayern are the club who, up until 2001, 2002, in the first decade of the Champions League, they made more money out of it in terms of prize money TV than anyone else. They're a genuine behemoth of the Champions League. And Chelsea have got to five semi-finals in eight years. So, you know, th th these aren't any uh, little guys punching above their weight. Sure. You know, these are clubs that really belong in the Champions League and uh, you know their performances are, are over you know the, since it's been not not just in 1992 but in the case of Bayern way back since the 70s you know they're clubs that represent the very essence of what the competition's about I don't know do you buy this argument I mean, well, this is the like thing I don't know how much this, of this it whole is historical just... pedigree Crap. Yes, Sorry. yes I think that's important because I genuinely think that's one of the reasons why Manchester City didn't do that wonderfully well I do think that history... It's not just players, huge. it's experience. It's, it is definitely experience. Because look at Borussia Dortmund. Look at Borussia, belonging, Dortmund. Back to 60s look at Borussia Dortmund. Look at Manchester City. Mm -hmm. They didn't have maybe the experience to take them yeah. that one step further. So riddle me this. Why have Chelsea reached, what you said, was it five semifinals or five quarterfinals they reached when they have no Champions League history to speak of before 1999? Chelsea is perhaps the one team I cannot explain how they reached uh, that mm -hmm. because it's always been their primary target. Monaco, of course, won the Champions League many times before they no, reached the final. No, you're always going to listen. Listen, you're always going to find. <laughs> right. But, but they, 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 they had a coach who that had that, thing. that understanding of what it was about. So yeah. that was completely different. Exactly. Right? But you can always find exceptions to every rule. But the general rule is, is that you need experience in these types right. of competitions. I, I, I need help here. I need help from, uh, um, from James. James, wait, we were talking about, just quickly, we we're going to look at in, in detail at uh, the two teams in particular, the, the Bayern side because obviously there have been many suspensions but I ask you these people are t giving me the, 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 the pedigree line and the fact that you know Chelsea weren't very good this year sixth in the Premier League and but I don't actually think that. I don't think it's a case of experience that these two have reached the finals and what is it then you're well, saying it, I'm saying does it matter that these teams aren't very good this year yet they're in the final but this is football um, can That's I the just whole make a point? as a Liverpool fan it doesn't because we won the final in exactly there you go <laughs> Well, listen, I'm uh, a Juventus fan, and we've reached it seven times. We choke most of them. So. <laughs> All right, well, let's talk, let's talk suspensions, of course. Four suspensions uh, for Chelsea in this final. Three suspensions for, um, for, for, for Bayern Munich. Holger Batshuba, David Alaba, and uh, Luis Gustavo. Now, I think, I'm going to throw this out there, the Bayern suspensions hit hardest because they all kind of hit the same position. I mean, Bajduba, Borteng, you would expect to be the first choice partnership. Um, Bajduba's out, you would expect um, Luis Gustavo to play in central defense, but he's suspended too. Daniel Van Boyden's the other option. He's been out since January, came back, played an hour or so, right, on, on Friday for the uh, uh, Bayern Munich amateurs. Um, no idea if he's going to be fit. They may have to play Timoshuk, 
Uh, unless, of course, there's Breno, but he's going to prison um, or he's on trial. <laughs> yeah, and, and I wouldn't play Van Boyten either after what happened to him in the last Champions League final, especially if he's not 100% fit. So you're kind of left with a Natalie Timmershook, really, um, as the only option. And I think you're right in saying they're the harder hitting ones. At the, be- at the beginning of the season, had you said to Bayern, OK, you're going to play a Champions League final without these three players, they probably would have only blinked an eye at Barge Duber being missing. Um, but now Gustavo and Alaba, especially after what they did against Real Madrid in the semi finals, proved that they were very key players to that victory um, overall, and they will be missed. Um, ultimately, Rafinha will come in at right back, and Lam will probably shift over to left back. Well, actually, well, I'll ask you about the, the, the fullback situation in a minute. But, and yeah, I want to ask you um, Anatoly Timoshuk, a 5'11, 33, 34 year old, slow Ukrainian holding midfielder up against the man-child that is DDA Drogba. <laughs> um, yeah. That's a huge mismatch, isn't it? Uh, I mean, you have to say Van Boyten physically is, is made for it. Yeah, if but Van Boyten couldn't catch Drogba mm. if Drogba was hopping on one leg, though. That's the flip yeah, side Yeah, but he'd still be a better choice. Yeah, I, I, th- I think the, 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 the problem, and to, I'd, I'd love to take this back to James, actually, is that I think Timoshuk is really needed in midfield, especially with uh, Gustavo not playing. Because Tony Kroos, when he's played deeper, mm. both for Bayern and for Germany, he's not the full ticket. He's about being further up. He's about replacing Muller. He's about the mobility that he can given of course Chelsea have got their own defensive problems so don't you think it's, it's, it's more important that especially as Bayern are at home especially as they've got that momentum behind them that they really go for this game have Timoshuk in midfield and Kroos in front of him well I mean this is it yes you're right in saying that Timoshuk would be well utilized in midfield for this match but I mean this is the thing and this is what it always comes back to with me in this final is that it's at home in the Allianz Arena for Bayern Munich and I feel that you Pengers will take the risk of playing Cruz and Schweinsteiger together. Yes, it takes away from Cruz's game a little bit, but at the same time, he does continue to dictate the pace of the game for Bayern from that position. And if anything, it frees Schweinsteiger a little more when he's going forward to kind of roam around and look for the areas that Bayern need him in as opposed to sticking to that playmaker role that obviously Cruz will assume. And, and that's the only reason I think if had this been in a neutral stadium, maybe we'd, we would have been debating Van Boyten coming back in. But as I say, you know, not 100 percent fit. He has the same kind of qualities, not the same physical qualities as Timoshuk, but they both read the game really well. And I almost feel that uh, Henkers is going to try and rely on that. Obviously, I mean, Boateng isn't the most reliable of partners either for uh, someone that's playing out of position. And so that really will be the point of weakness for Bayern. Bad Stuber, as I say, is a, is a huge loss for them because he's so consistently good, especially in the Champions League this season. But, you know, it, it's something that will be a key matchup in the match, that's for sure. I think Timoshuk will still start in central defence, though. James, um, do you think, well, considering what's happened against Borussia Dortmund in the game, um, it might be a blessing in disguise that Gomez is not playing, considering his terrible performance, as is Boateng's performance in that match. But what I would, uh, wanted to ask you is, is this forcing them to play a more attacking style of football, considering Muller's involved now going forward, you know, with the defence sort of unsteady and a little bit fragile, and they've got Cruz in midfield, you've got Muller playing, and is, of course, with Robin and do, are they going to lose a little bit of their defensive edge and, and make it very open for a team like Chelsea who love to play on the counter-attack? I think to an extent. Um, they're not going to be as strong defensively as they have been this season. I think the fact is we've seen Henkers instill this philosophy in this side that they all track back maybe Iron Robin exception sometimes. Um, but other than that, they all really do work hard on the defensive end as well. Ribery in particular on the left-hand side. His combination play with Alaba actually was sensational against Real Madrid, both defensively and going forward. And so I almost think the loss of that partnership will, will certainly hit Bayern. I also think Ribery will be a key player for Bayern. But the fact is, I said this before the Real Madrid match, and I almost feel it might be the same for the, the final, that Bayern will look go into this match just aiming to score more. Um, and the key for me will be them scoring in the first 15 minutes, because if they allow... Chelsea to settle into a rhythm in the match, um, they will get increased. They will be increasingly under pressure from the home fans to do something about it and to remedy the situation. J- James, uh, um, let's take this opportunity. Let's look at the two project projected lineup. As Mina, by the way, I don't agree at all that Chelsea love to play on the on the counter attack. I think, um, but we'll get we'll get well, into that with more. With our Ramirez now, we'll, so we'll, that's they're not their option. Kind but of. Um, we've got we've got these lineups for Chelsea, which we'll get to later. But it's Czech, Basinga, Kale, Luis, and Cole across the back. Mikel, Lampard, and Essien in midfield. Mata, Drogba, Kalu up front. 
for Bayern, as we said, um, Neuer, Rafinha, Boateng, Timoshuk, Lam, Schweinsteiger, Kroos, and then uh, line of three, Thomas Muller, uh, Iron Robin, Frank Ribery, and the big man, Mario Gomez. Now, are we, any shot that Diego Contento, the man named for Diego Maradona, might get in there with Lam switching to right back? Because the idea of Rafinha out there again and having another brain fart, I don't know if that's, <laughs> if that's something Heinkes wants. Good point. Well, that's it. I mean, it's Rafinha against Mata or, or putting Contento maybe up against a Daniel Sturridge type on the right-hand side, cutting into his stronger foot. And I mean, ultimately, Contento hasn't played much this season, which is the only reason I think he'll probably defer from bringing him in at left-back. But it, it's certainly an option. And Henkers, I, you know, it, it probably actually wouldn't surprise me if he were to choose Contento. But at right now, I'd say it's still more likely that we'd see Lam shift back over there and Rafinha come in because Rafinha has at least played in the Champions League more often than Contento, has a little more experience as a right back. Um, and, you know, going up against a, a player like Juan Mata on the left for Chelsea, it's similar, you know, they're similar styles of players, both fleet footed. And so I think Rafinha might be favoured in this situation, but it's going to be. It's going to be a game time decision, I think, on that one for Hankers. Now we, we 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 look at the big names, but I am I, I'm a big believer in in, in form, um, and we're going to ask you for prediction in a minute as well. But before we get there, which players, which people look at it like, oh Schweinsteiger, he's awesome. I remember him watching him on television. Mick Blanca, he's been really bad since he's come back from injury, in my opinion. Um, who else is a big name who's been rubbish and who's actually been very good? The people should look out for it. Well, I mean, obviously, yeah, you're right in saying Schweinsteiger. I don't know whether it really bad is... is by his standards. high standards. Certain, yeah, by his high standards, he's certainly fallen short since he's come back from injury. Um, the other player that really hasn't performed this season for Bayern is Thomas Muller. Obviously, everyone is expecting big things from him every season, and he hasn't quite delivered this season despite playing a lot of matches. But then, obviously, the, the front three of Gomez, Robin, and Ribéry Robbins had his rough patches this season, but you know he, he did come back at the end just a little bit. Bayern actually played some really good matches towards the end of the season, even after they had lost the title. Ribery for me against Basinga is a key matchup, and then Gomez against potentially Cahill, Luis. I don't know which combination is going to come out there, but you know he scored 13 goals in 13 appearances in the Champions League, league this season, 11 of which have come at home. Um, in the Allianz Arena. And so stats like that, for me, give them the edge. And the front three for Bayern are definitely the ones to watch out for. And then Cruz, as we mentioned, the man who will dictate the pace and link up the play, allowing Schweini to roam a little freer and maybe not have as much responsibility in the match, which I think might actually aid his performance. James, uh, uh, we got to end with a prediction because people love predictions and we'll hold you to it quickly. As do I. 3-1 Bayern Munich. James wow. Thurgood, thank you so much. You know, I'm from, from Bundesliga.com. Um, Mina. Uh, Can you go back to that? Because for me, when I, we were talking about Chelsea, I found that in the Champions League, they seem to like to defend deep under Di Matteo and then try to go forward, you know, via counter attacking wise with players like Ramirez. You don't think that's how they've really been playing? I, I don't think it's part of Chelsea's DNA to do. Certainly not no, part of I Di Matteo's DNA. I don't think that's DNA. part of their. They don't have I think a it's DNA circumstance rather than I think choice. It's been, I think it's been circumstance. And I think had As Ramirez. Such, do you not think that's what they're going to do against no, Bayern? No, because in that Ramirez case? and Merlis aren't there. I, I think he's very big on having the, the, what he calls two way player who can mm -hmm. uh, who, who do that. I mean, I think Merlis is a great player. I don't think Di Matteo thinks Merlis is a good, is a big player. But he does that, that what the Spanish. So what call, will be their tactic then? Well, I, I haven't spoken to Di Matteo about this, he hasn't told me, but I think the, they're toying with the idea of actually exploiting the fact that um, Bayern are so undermanned at the back. And, uh, uh, you know, if, if they do go with the three man midfield, I think it's going to be more geared towards pressing and winning the ball and, and, and trying, to, trying to make sure that Lam and Rafinha don't get forward at all, leaving, leaving Kalu up there and just getting a lot of service into, into Drogba um, and, and not really going and sitting deep. So it's a case of, well, they can't really sit deep because Bayern will rip them apart. Well, in some ways, though, Andy, there is, there is a logic to playing deep because you don't want to mm. leave space for Robin and Ribéry to run behind. Yeah, and creating that, that siege mentality that's got them through so far, really, you know, certainly against, against Napoli, uh, to a certain extent against Benfica when they were completely outplayed. Uh, for a lot of that game, even though Benfica had 10 men in the second leg at Stamford Bridge. Uh, and certainly the Barcelona is the obvious one. But f for me, I think that the important thing is that Bayern just don't go too gung-ho. They don't get carried by the occasion. They don't get carried by the fact that they're in their home stadium. 
I think certainly with the defensive problems they've got and certainly getting that defensive two, the, uh, the defensive two midfielders, the blend of that right, and why I would say Timoshuk being there is very important for control. But you is, play him there, though, you, you, what do you do? Have a gap and... and you, if you play him there, I, you have I, to I play think, Van Boyten. I think Van Boyten's worth the risk. I, I and, agree. And, and you, you put, you put Boyten on, on, on Drogba. And you don't play but I, I think controlling, but, but, controlling matter is the most important thing because he's going to drift into the centre. So to, to have those two central midfielders right, I think is very, very important. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Well, plenty more to get, uh, to get stuck into. We're going to be uh, back in a few when we'll be speaking to former Chelsea legend Pat Nevin. Hello and welcome back to our special Champions League preview show. Now we've discussed Bayern in detail, we're now going to move on to Chelsea and um, I believe that uh, we have Pat Nevin with us to discuss their way forward and what we think will happen in the teams that they've deployed. Just uh, a quick one with from you guys, what do you think will be the, the team that will start? You, are you happy with the midfield and defence choices? Well, I, I think they're limited. I think they're going to have to change things around. Really interesting. I think you know, he's expecting a lot out of Michael Essien between now and the week. Essien's not had a great season. On paper, you would expect Essien to start given the suspensions, but I'm wondering if he might not be tempted to, to go to find a different solution, perhaps stick the, with the, that 4 2 3 1 with, with Lampard and Mikel in front of the back four, and maybe Maluda doing the Ramirez role, which is a big ask, I know. Mm -hmm. But you know, quality-wise, but is Maluda fit? Because we don't know if he's going to be available. Yeah, so it's, it's a it's a question, isn't it? And I, I think you, you have to worry about um, Essien as well. I think part of his form this season, you, you just wonder how much he's got in the tank. He used to really eat ground up, yeah. and he doesn't do that anymore. Which I think, you know, if he was going to be an emergency centre back, they would miss him in midfield less than sure. they used to. But we've got Pat with us now on the telephone. Pat, can you hear us? I can hear loud and clear. Okay, so what do you think of the uh, suspected lineup that we've got for Chelsea, and how do you think Di Matteo will go ahead? I mean, he's seen Bayern Munich play uh, against Borussia Dortmund the other day. How do you think he'll set his team up? Well, a lot obviously depends on whether Luis and Cahill are available. I mean, if we took it for, I, I think it's quite unlikely that both will be available. If they were, then it makes it a lot easier for them. I hear what the guys are saying about Michael Essien, and I, and I agree with Gab particularly that he's not had a good season. I don't think he's got those legs anymore that he used to have. And in that case, what you only place you can play him is at the centre of the midfield defensively. You end up putting him alongside Mikel as the centre midfield area, and just an area where he can kill the play. Now, he's got that amount of legs that he can do that, he can make those tackles. He reads the game quite well as well, and he's got a decent amount of power, but... If you ask him to go and do a normal midfield role, which he used to do, get up and down the pitch, I don't think he's got that against the top quality players anymore. And I'm not convinced he'll ever have it again uh, with the two injuries he's had before and his inability to get to that sort of level anymore. Um, I think the interesting thing, technique-wise, what you, what you will do, whether, again, as Gab says, you, do you change the system and, and look for something different, um, my temptation would to you know really be quite defensive and probably ask Mikel... Lampard and Essien to play as a three sitting midfielders, much the same way as they tried against Barcelona, and uh, particularly at the New Camp, and then ask Kalou, Mata, and probably Drogba to get as far forward as possible, as often as possible. You know, not as defensive as they did against Barcelona, but certainly to try and soak up some pressure because if you give enough space to the likes of Ribery, Robin, Gomez, obviously, and Chris coming from midfield you know, they're going to destroy Kelsey. So they need to make sure that defensive area is killed. Pat, I, I wanted to ask you, uh, as an ex-pro, I mean, we're talking about, I mean, we're just all in the dark about Cahill and, and David Luiz, but what we do know, if they are fit, um, they won't have played a single game in, in, in about a month. Um, how, do, how does a coach, um, how does a physio, how, does, how do you as a player assess whether you're ready to start? How do you know well, when you haven't done it? Well, you, you know, well, the, the difficult one actually is Cahill, le, less so than Louise. I think Louise will be able to find out through his injuries, but Cahill is much more an obvious hamstring, and you basically don't know, because you will try as much training as you can, you will push it as far as you can. 
But it's, it's the old cliche from the pros, we always say the same. You don't know until max situation, until you try and explode, whether that hamstring is going to hold, you know, and it's, it's the worst injury. I mean, along with uh, Achilles tendon injuries, they are the worst injuries to gauge because however many reserve games you play, trying to play an explosive game and, you know, a top-level game is totally different. So Cahill is maybe the biggest fear of, of the two of them. If Luis will probably know, you know, he can get through a 90 minutes, you know, he'll do some twisting and turning, all that sort of stuff, all the normal stuff you would do. But as I say, Cahill's a different one. If it's one of those ones where it's touch and go, you start them. You absolutely start them. Because what's the worst that can happen? They get injured and you go have to go to plan B. It's not the perfect situation. And the Chelsea are so tight with numbers at the moment and with quality players in that back area. I don't think you've got a choice at that point in time. I think you have to go... If, you, if they tell you that they think you're good enough, then you go with them. And if they injure and go off after 10 minutes, as Kay Hill did in the Champions League semi-final, then you have to go on with you look for plan B. Do you move a single into centre-back? He did okay against Barcelona, but let's be honest, he's not a centre-half. And the idea of him playing against Mario Gomez, well, I think yourself and myself and any Chelsea fan listening would be quaking <laughs> in the boots at the thought. OK, but let's just say worst-case scenario is that, you know, you play them. Worst-case scenario, you take them off, and then you're left with one substitution for the entire match. Now, you can't change tactics. You can't change... Um, you'll probably only really be allowed to bring in Fernando Torres, perhaps. You'll, that would mean the rest of the team will be on. Isn't that too much of a gamble when you're considering the fact that you, you're left with only really one big substitution left to make? Yeah. It's a massive gamble, you're absolutely right. And the only way you can do it is trying to have some players on that field who are, you know, who have got transferable skills. Now, one of them, as we see, is Essien has got transferable skills, he can play at centre-back. Basingo has got transferable skills, he can play, he can move into centre-back. But you're right, it's a massive chance to take. And it's whether he takes a chance with both of them. You know, it's one of those ones, if it's a, if it's a 60-40 chance, you you know, you're not maybe taking it. If it's a seventy thirty chance, you maybe take it. It's a really difficult one for the manager to go with. The the one again, another positive on his position, if you play a slightly more defensive negative game, then you won't be stressing it too much too often. You won't be running a hundred miles an hour for a ninety stroke hundred and twenty minutes. You will be doing it, you know, from a defensive position. That's why I mentioned the fact that SEM might be a temptation because you will not be asking them to put the miles in. You'll just ask them to do a defensive job. And the same you could maybe say about Louise and Cahill, mm -hmm. although I can I can hear you thinking it right now. Try and ask Louise to play within himself. <laughs> I can't imagine he's capable of doing it. <laughs> Okay, Pat, is there any chance that we would ever see from Di Matteo in this last game, just for, just a thought, would we ever see Fernando Torres playing alongside Didier Drogba? If it was me who was picking the team right now, they would both start. But they won't, wouldn't both start up front. Didier Drogba would start up front and Fernando Torres would start in the right wing. Um, I've watched him a lot this season. Um, in fact, I've watched him just every game this season. And his creative play has probably been better than his goal-scoring play. When he's often run out wide, sometimes when he shouldn't have run out wide because he should have been playing a set forward, when he's run out wide, his creative play's been very good. His paces look good out there as well. If it was a choice between him and, say, Sturridge, as a, and I played in the right wing and the left wing myself for the vast majority of my career, I would take Fernando Torres every single time. And I know everyone thinks of him purely as a set forward, but... I remember Gary Lineker getting stuck out in the wide areas for Barcelona when he went over there, and he did a good job. Not a wonderful, phenomenal, best winger in the world job, but a good enough job. And if I had to choose between Torres and, as I say, Sturridge, or maybe even Kalou, I would be going with Torres, because the other thing you have to look at is, I'm sure you have talked already about Bayern Munich. If Bayern Munich have got a, def have a problem, they've got a problem in defence. You know, the players that they're missing... We know for a fact that uh, they're going to have Alaba out and Batshtubar out as well. Gustavo can play in a kind of more defensive role as well. You have to try and get to them. If you're going to win a Champions League final, the likelihood in this game, with so many defenders missing in both sides, is you're going to have to score a few goals. Have Torres on there and ask him to do the work. Because the other thing about him, again, anyone who's watched him this season, he's not afraid of hard work. He sometimes actually works slightly too much more in a defensive way than he should do when he's playing up front. You put him in the wide areas, 
I think he's quite capable of doing the job. And don't be surprised if it actually happens, because quite a few times this season, when Didier Drogba has been brought in on an extremist, they have moved Torres out to the wide areas, and I think he's looked quite good. Pat, I actually would agree with you entirely. I would play him if it was up to me. But just quickly, if I was to ask you for a prediction, what would you say? I hate being asked this now because <laughs> we asked predictions of you know, the, the game at the new Camp between Chelsea and, and Barcelona. And I was absolutely full on 4-0 Barcelona. Easy. No problem at all. And what Do that again. This <laughs> one, my mind tells me absolutely the Bayern Munich, with everything going from, are going to win this in quite comfortably, maybe two or three now. I'll stick with that in the great hope that I'm wrong. Okay, thank you so much for joining <laughs> us Pat. on the show. Thank you to Pat Cheers, Nevin. Thank you. Right, uh, after the break, we'll be, we'll be discussing the route to the final. So we'll see you then. Hello and welcome back to the Champions League preview show. I'm Mina Rizuki and now we're going to talk about the road to Munich with both Chelsea suffering a, a somewhat less terrible group than what Bayern had to go through being in a group that included Manchester City, Napoli and Villa Real. Um, so let's have a look at the scores and uh, how it set out. What do you think? I mean, Bayern had a trim. They, they were absolutely brilliant um, going through to the Champions League. Um, really, only stuttering a couple of one. Possibly. Well, they, they lost to Basel. And that was it, really. And Basel was just the. I thought game. they were pretty poor. I thought I, I think Marseille has been horrible this year. But yeah. I thought Bayern were pretty poor against Marseille as well. And then. But I think that's probably. Do you think maybe arrogance, overconfidence? Well, I think there was a certain situation at Marseille and that um, Frank Ribéry had to face some pretty awful treatment. Um, he's, he's not particularly loved in France. And, you know, Germany's his comfort bubble, really. Yes. You know, he, he, he feels great within Bayern, and that's why he stayed there. And he feels particularly close to Hein because he never really had a great relationship with Van Hal. So I think when you diminish Ribéry, and of, of course this is something that Chelsea could look at, when you diminish Ribéry, you diminish a, a lot of what Bayern could, can do as well. They already know about Robin. Uh, but as James was saying earlier, Ribéry's worked so hard this season. It's not just what he's provided in the attacking sense, but how hard he works for the team as well. So I, I think Chelsea getting that right-hand side right, I think they'll miss Ivanovic. Yeah. That's something they really need to get right. And they'll miss Ramirez, of course, I mean, as well. I, it's interesting, this whole sort of Ribery robin dichotomy, because since they've both been at the club, it um, hasn't been that often that they've both been fit and mm -hmm. playing well at the same time. Robin is still depicted as somebody, in my mind, I, I see him as somebody who's ridiculously inconsistent, um, very injury-prone, but when he's on, he just scares the pants off you. I mean, you can mm -hmm. figure out how to stop Ribery, but when Robin's really on, I mean, can you stop him? You just deny service? No, but I do think that you have to just not let him shoot with his best foot. You know that he's always going to cut inside. He has traditional ways of playing in, in the way that, it, you know, perhaps you can stop it. I mean, allowed you at the time wrote on Twitter that the reason why Mourinho didn't like him is because he didn't think he had that winning mentality that was so important for a Mourinho-led team. That's what he wrote on his Twitter. I mean, it's allowed you. Let's not expect too much. But isn't that but the truly frightening thing about Robin, that you know exactly what he's going to do? But he still you know that it's all effort. He's going to do it anyway. Anyway, his control's too good, his pace is too much. Uh, and uh, the fact that he can come really, really deep and pick the ball up and start a run makes it very, very difficult so, to so stop really, him. Why is he so inconsistent? Because one theory is that his body is just, he's a great fragile. athlete, but everything's so mm. finely tuned and so fragile that yeah. anything less than 100% in his performance really I, drops off. I think that's part of it. And I think you have to look at the fact that his attitude's been really questioned at every club yes. he's, he's been at. And I, I think if you go back to, as you say, Mourinho questioning his commitment, um, you, you, you had the same thing at Real Madrid as well, where you know he, he didn't really make that effort to respond and encourage young players as he should have done as a senior pro. Marcelo is a very good example of that when they were playing on the left together. He, he didn't really get much change out of Robin, and obviously he's had his issues in the dressing room at Bayern as well. But he's and got to a Ribery, point where yeah. it's where yeah, but not just with Ribery, but with quite a lot of the other players as well. But you know you have the sense that that Heinkers is this this pragmatist, so his caprices are tolerated and he can get the best out. Of him whenever he's fit. I mean, yeah, it, does it? I mean, Bayern apparently. So they got rid of Van Hal because 
Van Hal was a genius. Because I, I, I sort of see this, I want to throw this out to both of you, see there's a bit of a parallel here, right? So Van Hal was, I think we all agree, is a genius with a pretty nasty personality <laughs> at times who will clash with his players. Um, and he was replaced by a guy who's generally seen to be laid back um, and, and a nice guy and sort of a player's coach and quite popular with the players. Um, at Chelsea, Villas Boas was a genius, a wunderkind genius in his own way, who also had issues of how to relate his ideas to the players and had a, a bit of an edge. And he's replaced by Di Matteo, who's, again, certainly maybe not the fuzziest, warm and cuddliest guy in the world, but certainly very laid back, cool, and also because he's you know, not that much older than a lot of these players, perhaps also kind of more in tune with the players than uh, certainly more so than Villas Boas. Is, is, that, is that parallel there? I think there is because I, I think you can both see uh, the machinery of the club running things r rather than you know an old style dictatorial manager and and, and so the, the the players have so much more of an input on the actual pitch and on the, on the tactical side of it and I think that's really interesting and that, that that's the way it's going to have to work for this now I, I think it's going to be I think it's going to be a really great final just because it's so short-termist yeah. what but, both of them are running it's so but, but then again though, if you talk about club machinery Mina at Bayern you have a machinery, mm. Ernest and Rummenigge. This is and what Nailinger. I mean. You're talking Chelsea, about a, you there don't is have no machinery. that. You have this one coach who has, you know, power, uh, and he has sort of, you know, unilaterally he makes all the decisions. Whereas with Bayern, they're such a well-run club. They're owned by the fans. Over eighty percent is owned by. It. It's a different ideology. They're really it's owned by the fans. It's just a lie they like to tell us. But <laughs> go ahead. But really, is that a lie? Don't don't you, much, don't yeah. you think uh, about about they're, 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 they're similar they're similar structures but in different places in the club. So it's the, the power structure, uh, the arrogance, the people who run it are upstairs at Bayern, whereas they're on the pitch at Chelsea. Yes, that's, yeah, that's true. That, that's it. That's and, also true. And that's why they made this transition though from the tactical visionary to the guy who sees the pragmatist. Now I would argue that Di Matteo though is also a fact something of a tactical visionary, and we've kind of or certainly got yes. to play progressive football. I agree with that. I met a lot of footballers. He is definitely one of the most intelligent people I have ever met in, in football. And because he's more soft-spoken, mm -hmm. it didn't show up. But Mina, how many footballers, after they retire as zillionaires, um, spend their sort of weekends studying to get an MBA? Not many. No, you're, you're right about that. Juan Mata's doing it while he's playing. <laughs> so uh, we have to give him credit for that. And that's where we, the player, will win the final. Yeah, but, but that's quite, me, you know, a lot of, anyway, but that's not what I'm talking, you know, you were talking about the parallels between them. But with what you say with Bayern Munich is the fact that they've got this laid back coach and this, you know, this wonderful sort of, you know, coach who has developed these relationships with his players. But it's still, when you look at Bayern, you still think of it more as these individual talents that can create moments of magic. Whereas when you look at Chelsea, that's perhaps not how you define them. In, out went Villas Boas, in went Di Man in came in Di Matteo, who created more of a team more unit. More of a system. More of a system. And it's, in fact, kind of opposing to what Bayern have. So yeah. it's still similar managers, but kind of what they've created is a little bit maybe different. I think it's a good different. point, but I'm wondering, isn't that a bit of an indictment of, of Heinkes? Or, or is it just a function of the players who are there? Because sometimes you look at Bayern and it does kind of feel that rather than much of a system, it's kind of like, okay, you The great Rangers, robin, the great robbery. The well, wait yeah. for these guys to do something and provide service to, to Gomez and wait for him to, 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 to put in the back of the net. Yeah, it's, 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 it's not ideal, and as I was saying before, it's, it, it's short-termist, but that's what makes this such a great final. The fact that they're winging it with uh, injured <laughs> and suspended players, you know, the, the, the fact that you know that the, the, the way these clubs are working dysfunctionally, certainly to, in, in, in the sense of Chelsea, is not going to last and something big needs to change. The fact that Dortmund have laid down that marker and they've got such a great structure on and off the pitch, it means Bayern are going to have to step up. I think this shows, you know, everything's riding on this one match it doesn't matter about the future it doesn't matter about the past it's just about the one moment and that's what a final should be Mina if you were Louis van Gaal mm. watching this champ this this final and let's say Bayern actually lose would you feel vindicated would you feel that okay surely now they must treat Heinkes the way they treated me and just sack him immediately and start over or would you stick with Heinkes another season after what's gone wrong. And let me remind you, it wasn't, you know, it was spent a lot of money on Boateng. Um, they spent a huge amount of man on Neuer, the second most expensive goalkeeper in history. You know, they gave, they, they put in the tools for Heinkes to succeed this season. 
Certainly, and I, I am kind of playing a, the, the part of Van Hal now, but you could yes. argue he got more support than Van Hal did in his second season. Yes, I mean, to be honest, if they're going to play fair, then yes, it would mean that he would need to get sacked for his decisions. There are times during the league when you would watch Bayern and you would see that there is, you know, there's just sort of this malaise about them and, and, and the fact that they sometimes approach matches with a lethargic... Mm with a lethargic approach, um, it's quite individualistic, uh, they, they weren't really up for it in the games that genuinely mattered at times. I think they did a terrific job um, against Borussia Dortmund after they conceded a goal, but there was something about Bayern this season that isn't clicking and I think that that is something to do, a lot to do with Heinkes because when you look at him as a coach, I don't think he inspires that kind of do or die, you know. So but but that's, 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 not, that's not his job, is it? He's, he's a conduit, a facilitator. I mean, I, I think if you're looking at the reason that Bayern haven't clicked maybe domestically this season, you just have to come back to the final. This is what matters. This is the be-all and end-all. If they win the final, they won't care that they got belted in the cup final. Well, they won't we're, we're care assuming, that they lost the league. We're assuming they won't win it. Yeah. I'm saying if yeah. they won't win it. But actually, I'm just, we're going to go a second. I'm asking, why was it? I, I thought Bayer Lever, Heinkes' Bayer Leverkusen played really good football with, mm. with, with those guys in, 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 in midfield. Oh, Casillas completely well. saved them in two thousand um, uh, Real Madrid in 2002, didn't they? But, no, no, I'm talking about, about last season mm. when, when he was at Bayer Leverkusen. Right. This Bayern team do not play good football. I would disagree with that. I think um, play, you don't think so? They don't play, I mean, in terms of organized team football, um, the way they did. It's the same manager. It's a different team. Is it really... Has even Heinke struggled? I mean, has he been forced to be the facilitator when, in fact, he'd like to maybe give it more of, a, of, 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 of an identity? Well, he's, he's someone who knows what Bayern's like. He's managed them before, of course. So I think he's gone in with his eyes open, and he knows he's going to have to be that sort of coach. They've got him in because they, they know he's not a dictator. They know he's not a Van Hal. They know he's not a McGutt. So it's a, a different approach. And it's certainly worked at the start of the season. When they were playing very well, they looked as if they would sweep all before them, especially because Dortmund had the stuttery start. And, you know, if we go back to the start of the Champions League campaign, they were sensational against Manchester City at the Alliance, and there looked to be an absolutely huge gap between, between the two clubs and the two teams. But I, I think, you know, you have to look at how, how that's panned out over the season. And it, it, it has been difficult for him. I think you have to look at squad depth. I think that's, uh, that's been a difficulty for him as well. Yes. But uh, with, with Bayern, it's, you know, it's, it's not just about getting everyone on side because there was almost a new manager bump what they had at the start of the season. I think they have to give this more time to, to see how it's going to pan out. They can't just sack him and go straight back to another dictator. It, it, it won't work, I don't think. That is true. Um, what Bayern does is going to be uh, interesting to see. But we will come back after the break and we'll be taking a nostalgic journey down the best games of the Champions League. We'll see you in a few. We're back on this special edition of the World Football Show looking at Bayern Munich and Chelsea final of the UEFA Champions League next Saturday, May 21st. Mina, as neutrals, I think everybody knows your footballing allegiance, um, so... You've I, made I, sure of that. You don't really have a dog in this race, or a horse in this race, or any kind of animal. Um, but neutrals want, you know, they want a classic final, something that we're gonna talk about for a while. To me, I see a final with a lot of goals in it, which is a bit counterintuitive, perhaps, because there's also supposed to be cagey affairs, but I look at the way these two defenses are, and I think to myself, hmm. You know, like, how can you not score? Um, do you see a, a, a good final? Are people in for a treat, or will it be sort of Valencia against Bayern from 2001, that level of dreariness? I don't think it's going to be like that. I think it's going to be a case of, it's going to be a little like that Chelsea versus Liverpool game in the semi-final a few seasons back, where it was just a case of bad defence. There were many Chelsea versus Liverpool ones. Um. You know, the 4-4... Four, four. <laughs> The 4-4. The, the, the one that we were awake for. No, the 4-4. Um, I remember I was in Stamford Bridge at the time. And so I just I. thought it was a case of bad defences, bad football, but a real great excitement, you know? And I think that this is how it looks at the moment with the, with how many absences they've both got, suspensions. I can see a lot of goals. I can't see very good, many, very many defences. I think there's going to, luck is going to play a huge part in this because I think a lot of that is the reason why certain teams have reached where they have. So I do think it's going to be thrilling. It might not be the very best on a, on a technical level. 
Well, you could argue the same going back through a lot of Chelsea's campaign, couldn't you? Um, like the, the, the Chelsea Napoli game at Stamford Bridge, which was an absolutely outstanding spectacle. A lot but of drama from that team. Error strewn. It was totally error strewn. You know, Chelsea flew by the seat of their pants. And, um, you know, I, th I think you can expect something similar. Like Bayern are very fallible as well. You know, I, I don't think their defence is the best at the best of times, even though they've got a far improved record this season. But do you buy that argument that when you have an evenly matched final, that's not error strewn. People start sniffing and saying, "Oh, it's boring because nothing's happening." Well, it's, of, of, yeah. course, of course, they, of course, they do because a, a Champions League final is, is more than just a football match. It's meant to appeal, like almost like a World Cup now, because it's got such mediatic status. It's meant to appeal to people beyond people who are obsessed with football, like us. You know, it's meant to be something that entertains, something that convinces people who, who aren't really that into football. So basically, you either need one side hammering the other, like Barcelona and United last year. Or you need a load of goals and, by definition, yeah, a lot of mistakes. I think of the 2003, everyone basically fell asleep during that final between Juventus I and I thought Milan. it was completely riveting, actually. I was there. Maybe you it was see, different. You see, for me, I thought that, that was a fantastic... Mm. But I like tactical football. I, I thought it was a very but Isn't that the difference between tension and entertainment? There's a difference? Yeah, certainly. You, you, have to, you have to have some vested interest in it. So well, well, I whether, had zero vested that's, interest. Yeah. Whether that's, whether I was trying to figure out a way for both teams to lose, actually. <laughs> But, um, I think that tells you about allegiance. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, but no, but I I don't know. I, I think um, I mean I think to the really casual fan, obviously you want to see teams take risks and and, and things. So like that. So what is a classic but final for you? What's been the you know this is the great moment. Well, I, you know when we were we, before we introduced the segment, we still need to come up with our classic finals, and I was thinking about it and sort of you know the most exciting Champions League final I've been to is uh, was in Istanbul. Yes. Um, but that was <laughs> full of mistakes. <laughs> but you had drama and all the other ingredients. Uh, the other one that often gets mentioned, which is, is, was the, the AC Milan, well, actually, two other ones. One, the, the 99 final, Bayern uh, against uh, Manchester United, where United basically didn't show up for, for, for 80 minutes. And I think even Sir Alex would admit he got his tactics completely wrong, and Bayern hammered them. And then, you know, you had that incredible turnaround. Um, and the 94 final with the, 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 the one-way, you know, AC Milan destroying the dream team and uh, tearing down the virtual statue of Johan Cruyff, <laughs> who then rebuilt it, of course, afterwards. Well, the other thing... But those were one-sided games. But the other thing you can say about the 94 final, it shows how suspensions can sort of liberate a team and, and, and make you think of something new. Because, of course, the, the, the fact is Capello went into that with a completely different mindset because he had Costa Curta suspended, he had Baresi suspended, he had to leave some um, non-Italian nationals out of the team. And, you know, that they were expected to try and contain Barcelona. Yeah, and, that, they, and they ended up ripping them. But on that point, though, people made a big deal. Oh, look, Baresi, Costa Curta. But if you look at the back four that he played in that team, you know, I think both Chelsea and Bayern would fantasize yes. about that because, yeah, so Costa Curta <laughs> was, out, was out, but hey, look, I'll play Filippo Galli, who's, you know, 31 and was a starter until, until the year before. Mm -hmm. um, I have my one center half. My other center half is, is this guy named Maldini, um, <laughs> who I've heard is pretty good. My, my right back is, uh, is, is Mauro Tassotti, who's been my starter all along. My left back was Christian Panucci, so I was pretty good. Like I think Capello kind of spun mm. this wonderful. Talk about suspensions. I mean, the ultimate example, Mina, is the '99 final. Um, of mm -hmm. course, Roy Keane and, uh, uh, and Paul Scholes out. Actually, uh, for those who are going to the game or getting a program for the final, I, I spent some time talking to uh, uh, various players who played in finals about their experience, and I, I sat down with Gary Neville, and he basically came out and said, "Well." we had everything wrong because everything was different. Um, without Keane and, and Scholes, uh, he played uh, Butt and David, Nicky Butt and David Beckham mm -hmm. in the center of midfield. He played Jesper Bl Blomquist on the left and he played Ryan Giggs on the right. And for Gary Neville, little Gary Neville at right back, who's so used, he's got that innate timing with Beckham with mm -hmm. making his runs and Beckham would always do things a certain way. He says, for 80 minutes, I had gigs in front of me, and I had no clue what the guy <laughs> was going to do. do. <laughs> and, you know, it's, and you realize sort of when you, especially when you've got some of those well-oiled partnerships. And, in fact, the last 10 minutes of the game, Beckham moved to the right-hand side, and all of a sudden, you know, United clicked. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just the, the, those, two, uh, uh, those two dramatic goals at the so, end. So that sounds to me like that was your favorite final. Well, I, I, I think it was certainly Gary Neville's favorite final. <laughs> <laughs> it was my favorite final. 
I, in terms of drama. Well, I, I'm assuming your your uh, favorite final was probably more 97 than 93. <laughs> uh, it's when they lost to Borussia Dortmund in the final, Juventus. Uh, was that 97? It was. It was. was, it was in, in, in fact. The Lars Ricken. Actually, to be honest, I loved 98 simply because I, I, uh, you I thought... You losing in finals. I did, weird. I did. It was, it was weird. It was cathartic. No, I wasn't a Juventus fan um, up until the final of 97 uh, because Del Piero came off the bench and scored that wonderful goal and I thought I've got to support this team. But also in 98, I thought Real Madrid when they won that with Heinkens and I thought that what's so amazing was that this was so touted to be like Juventus was going to win this and poor Real Madrid were not as good. And then Angelo Di Livio and a lot of the Juventus squad had 1-0 tattooed on, their, on the back of their hands. Now, when Raul saw that at the time, he thought, Screw, you know, we're going to win this because these guys think, think they're going to win 1-0. They went there and they had this sort of like possessed feeling that they had to win this. And of course, they won their Septima. Yeah, because it helps when Mijatovic scores an, uh, a goal clearly offside as well. But <laughs> of course. I, but I don't understand why uh, Delivio didn't learn from his mistake of 97 because I spoke to Paul Lambert some years back and he said while they were waiting in the tunnel, he was standing opposite Delivio and he just opened his palm and he had 3-1 written on it. So um, why would you do that two years in a row? I mean, admittedly, he did get the score right twice, but still. <laughs> well, I remember thinking, you got the 1-0 right, it was just to the wrong team. Um, <laughs> Maybe they should have gone down to the bookies. Actually, but then, don't then there's there the suspensions. You. No. When you think of what Pavel Nedved did for Juventus in the semi-final against Real Madrid, and then, of course, went on to not play the final against Milan. But um, probably, I would say Istanbul was the most dramatic and entertaining final that we've ever seen. But predictions, guys, what do you think is going to happen now if it was up? What do you think? How do you see this going about? Well, Chelsea have been on the seat of their pants throughout. <laughs> um, maybe they'll do it one more time. 2-1 to Chelsea. Really? really? You think Chelsea will lift this and John Terry will have his hands on the... He will. Well, fortunately, he'll have plenty of breath to sprint up those steps and uh, pick up the trophy. At the end of Mina, it. your prediction? We're all waiting with bated breath. 3-2 <laughs> to Bayern Munich. 3-2. Well, uh, I'm going to go with 3-2 as well. Thank you, Andy Brassel, Mina Rizuki. Now, notice I said 3-2. I didn't say to what team. Um, <laughs> I don't like to be forced to, be, to, to make predictions. And since I'm closing out the final segment, that's my tut, prerogative. Tut. Take care. <laughs> Luis Gustavo to play in central defense, but he's suspended too. Daniel Van Boyden's the other option. He's been out since January, came back, played an hour or so, right, on, on Friday for the uh, uh, Bayern Munich amateurs. Um, no idea if he's going to be fit. They may have to play Timoshuk, uh, unless, of course, there's Breno, but he's going to prison, um, or he's on trial. Facing <laughs> yeah, and, and I wouldn't away. play Van Boyden either after what happened to him in the last Champions League final, especially if he's not 100% fit. So you're kind of left with a Natalie Timoshuk, really, um, as the only option. And I think you're right in saying they're the harder hitting ones. At the, at the beginning of the season, had you said to Bayern, OK, you're going to play a Champions League final without these three players, they probably would have only blinked an eye at Barge Duba being missing. Um, but now Gustavo and Alaba, especially after what they did against Real Madrid in the semi finals, proved that they were very key players to that victory um, overall. And they will be missed. Um, ultimately, Rafinha will come in at right back and Lam will probably shift over to left back. Well, actually, well, I'll ask you about the, the, the fullback situation in a minute. But, Andy, I want to ask you um, Anatoly Timoshuk, a, a 5'11, 33, 34 year old, slow Ukrainian holding midfielder up against the man child that is DDA Drogba. <laughs> um, yeah. That's a huge mismatch, isn't it? I mean, you have to say Van Boyten physically is, is made for it. Yeah, if but Van Boyten couldn't catch Drogba mm. if Drogba was hopping on one leg, though. That's the flip yeah, side Yeah, but of that. he'd still be a better choice. Yeah, I, I, th I think the, 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 the problem, and to, I'd, I'd love to take this back to James, actually, is that I think Timoshuk is really needed in midfield, especially with... Uh, they have no Champions League history to speak of before 1999. Chelsea is perhaps the one team I cannot explain how they reached uh, that because it's always been their primary target. Monaco, of course, won the Champions League many times before they. No, you're the always going to listen. Quarter. Listen, you're always going to find. Right. But you, you, they, find they had a coach who that had kind of that, thing. that understanding of what it was about, so yeah. that was completely different. Exactly, right. but you can always find exceptions to every rule. But the general rule is is that you need experience in these types right. of competitions. I, I, I need help here. I need help from uh, um, from James. James, wait, we were talking about just quickly. We we're going to look at in, in detail at uh, the two teams in particular, the the. Bayern 
Iron Side because obviously there have been many suspensions. But I ask you, these people are t- giving me the, the 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 pedigree line and the fact that you know Chelsea weren't very good this year, sixth in the Premier League, and but I don't outclassed think by that. Bruce I don't think it's a case of experience that these two have reached the finals. And what is it then? You're well, saying. It, I'm saying, does it matter that these teams aren't very good this year, yet they're in the final? But this is football. Um, can That's I the just whole make a point? As a Liverpool fan, it doesn't because we won the final in 2005. Exactly. There you go. The <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, I'm uh, the Avengers fan, and we've reached it seven times. We choke most of them. So. <laughs> All right, well, let's talk, let's talk suspensions, of course. Four suspensions uh, for Chelsea in this final. Three suspensions for, um, for, for, for Bayern Munich. Holger Batshuva, David Alaba, and uh, Luis Gustavo. Now, I think, I'm going to throw this out there, the Bayern suspensions hit hardest because they all kind of hit the same position. I mean, Bajduba, Borteng, you would expect to be the first choice partnership. Um, Bajduba is out, you would expect um, uh, Gustavo not playing. Because Tony Kroos, when he's played deeper, mm. both for Bayern and for Germany, he's not the full ticket. He's about being further up. He's about replacing Muller. He's about the mobility that he can give. And of course, Chelsea have got their own defensive problems. So don't you think it's, it's, it's more important, that especially as Bayern are at home, especially as they've got that momentum behind them, that they really go for this game, have Timoshuk in midfield and Kroos in front of him? Well, I mean, this is it. Yes, you're right in saying that Timoshuk would be well utilised in midfield for this match. But, I mean, this is the thing, and this is what it always comes back to with me in this final, is that it's at home in the Allianz Arena for Bayern Munich. And I feel that Jupp Hengers will take the risk of playing Kroos and Schweinsteiger together. Yes, it takes away from Kroos's game a little bit, but at the same time, he does continue to dictate the pace of the game for Bayern from that position. And if anything, it frees Schweinsteiger a little more when he's going forward to kind of roam around and look for the areas that Bayern need him in as opposed to sticking to that playmaker role that obviously Cruz will assume. And, and that's the only reason I think if had this been in a neutral stadium, maybe we'd, we would have been debating Van Boyten coming back in. But as I say, you know, not 100% fit. He has the same kind of qualities, not the same physical qualities as Tim Schuch, but they both read the game really well. And I almost feel that uh, Henkers is going to try and rely on that. Obviously, I mean, Boateng isn't the most reliable of partners either for uh, someone that's playing out of position. And so that really will be the point of weakness for Bayern. Bad Stuber, as I say, is a, is a huge loss for them because he's so consistently good, especially in the Champions League this season. But, you know, it, it's something that will be a key matchup in the match. That The year before that was Barcelona and United. Again, champions against, well, United finished a close second to Chelsea that season. I mean... Um, those were legit teams. I look at this with my cynical hat on. Neither one of these teams, they can win it, but nobody's going to say this team's the best in the world or maybe even in the top three or four, right? But nevertheless, I think we've been rather spoiled by Barcelona in that respect, you could say. Uh, And by United being in the final too? Yeah, certainly, certainly. And if if you think about it, you know, uh, Bayern are the club who up until 2001, 2002, in the first decade of the Champions League, they made more money out of it in terms of prize money, TV, than anyone else. They're a genuine behemoth of the Champions League. And Chelsea have got to five semi-finals in eight years. So, you know, these aren't any uh, little guys punching above their weight. Sure. You know, these are clubs that really belong in the Champions League and, uh, you know, their performances are, are over, you know, the, since it's been not, not just in 1992, but in the case of Bayern, way back since the 70s. You know, they're clubs that represent the very essence of what the competition's about. I don't know. Do you buy this argument? I mean, you kind well, of this feel is the like thing. I don't know how much this, of this it is. This whole historical just... pedigree crap. Yes. Sorry. yes, I think that's important because I genuinely think that's one of the reasons why Manchester City didn't do that wonderfully well. I do think that history... It's not just players, it's experience. It's, it is definitely sense experience. Of belonging. Because look at Borussia sense of belonging Dortmund. Back to 60s look at Borussia 70s. Dortmund. Look at Manchester City. Mm-hmm. They didn't have maybe the experience to take them yeah. that one step further. So riddle me this. Why have Chelsea reached, what you said, was it five semifinals or five quarterfinals they reached when... They- Hi, it's the World Football Show, and uh, for the next hour or so, in this special one-off, we'll be looking at the UEFA Champions League Final. I'm Gabriel Marcotti, and I'm privileged that you're joining us, but not just me. I've got my co-host here, my little sidekick, uh, (laughs) Mina Rizuki, and of course, Mina, we have a special guest. It's the very handsome and knowledgeable Andy Brassel. Uh, 
How about we start? Yes, Andy does deserve applause, but we don't have a studio audience today. <laughs> so let's reserve our applause for Chelsea and Bayern. Um, first off, does it bother us that we have two teams that one of them likely, one of them finished sixth, the other one finished second this season? Does that affect our enjoyment of the Champions League final? Well, it doesn't affect my enjoyment. I think, if anything, that this shows you that the champ football is dramatic and you never know what's going to happen. And I think that I love the way that Chelsea won this uh how they reached the final. It was really it was really a game of, of heart and they really wanted to be there. So but, it was but about that. You said how they reached the final though, but Andy we kinda got used to it the last few years, right? Last mm -hmm. year we had United and and, and Barcelona, right? Yeah. So you had champions of, of the Premier League, champions of Spain. I mean champion won it that season. Mm -hmm. The year before that, um, Inter and Bayern, both teams on the verge of, of a treble. 